guys. Get ready for the dream right now. Let's do a little Sonic D as always. First thing, and what's kind of important here, is I'm a little sick. <laughs> I'll just come out and say that right now. I had big lofty plans to um, to continue going through the book this week. Um, I've already gone through and started flagging the top here for uh, the different sections and questions I wanted to talk about. However, um, due to my cold, I just didn't have the time to really put the effort in that I wanted to. So. No fear, we will do this next week, but what we're going to do instead is I'm going to answer all your questions. Um, as many questions as you guys can ask, go ahead and post them, start thinking about them, and we'll also do some uh, practice tests. And I've got my iPad rigged up so we can see it on the screen. It can be a collaborative type of effort. It's going to look, it's going to be really cool. Um, also, if you could, guys, share this. Share this with your friends, your family that would be interested in ham radio. Post it on your Facebook, your Twitter. Um, you can post the link to the stream. That'll go to the video after the streaming is done. So, all right. Woo, man, that's a that's a gassy beer. So I'll mention this too before we, we dive into it. As everybody starts coming on, we got a good amount of people coming in right now. That's awesome. Thanks for watching. Thanks so much. Um, ham radio. I'll make this just grandiose statement. And and I've always I've always had a, a hard time um, expressing ham radio to people like you know what um, what is it that's so compelling about ham radio? Well, it, it's communication, right? It's a communication mechanism, and it's really just point to point, right? You, your station, and the station you're talking to, or multiple stations, and how we do it is so diverse and interesting that you can almost find something. There's almost something for everybody in ham radio. Whether you want to do Morse code, which we've talked about, if you want to just stick with two-way radios like this, there's a ton you can do with this. You can do digital modes in that. You can get on your uh, local CERT team, Aries, Races. These are all emergency preparedness teams. Or you can just get uh, in, in a, a club that has their own repeater and just talk to people that way. It's very awesome. Got a question here. Aside hobby part and chit chat with unknown people, what was a useful way you used your radio? Um, so the primary useful thing that I do is with this radio right here. This guy's a Kenwood D72A. Uh, what I do with this guy is it's GPS enabled and it does APRS. You can go to uh, APRS dot fi and you can type in a call sign of whomever it is you're looking for and it will as long as they're transmitting uh, aprs you'll see where they're at you'll see their heading um elevation whatever sensors they may have on the radio and you can even email them you can send them little text messages via the aprs system it's a packet radio system meaning the radio uh digitize well sorry the tnc which is kind of like a, a simple computer will digitize the information the GPS uh, coordinates, your elevation, your heading, and your speed, and it will uh, transmit them out of the radio. So that's super useful. Also, uh, there was someone who contacted me. Gosh, where? Let me see if I can pull that up really quick. Someone contacted me, and they told me a story about how I I uh, introduced them, kind of, I guess, or, or incentivized them. I gave them a good reason why they should get involved with ham radio. And uh, that led them to finding a club, finding a local repeater. And after they had their radio programmed, they went on a hike or they had been hiking or something like that. And they got lost. Uh, they got lost in the forest. And I believe it was like uh, Greenland or Iceland or somewhere. And they, they ended up using their radio to get help because there was no cell reception. So that's pretty freaking awesome as far as I'm concerned. And every day people use things like Racy's and Aries and, and other uh, 
emergency response type stuff to help people in emergency situations. And I, I might have touched on this briefly, but I'm kind of quiet. Okay, thank you for telling me. Is that better? Hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, so I... Now I got totally sidetracked because I started messing with my mic. Uh, anyway, so... Oh, you know what? Is it, uh, is it because we got the wrong mic set? Hope not. No, we're good. Okay. So, um... <clears throat> Emergency preparedness and when disasters strike, ham radio is like one of the best things because, and you can go look at my comms videos, my emergency comms videos, but um, the signal just works, right? Again, it's, it's a, it's a two-way communication between handy talkies and if you need to go long distance, you use an HF rig. You don't have to worry about an infrastructure. You don't have to worry about telephones. You don't have to worry about cell phones. You don't have to worry about any of that. You use ham radio, right? So that's the most important part, one of the most important parts of ham radio is that you're prepared to help communicate and facilitate um, things when they don't go your way, disasters. In California, we've got a lot of earthquakes. That's one of the reasons why I have ham radio, to prepare for earthquakes. So I'm going um, <clears> to <throat> switch over here. So here is the um, application. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Thank you for telling me that the uh, the mic's better. So this is the uh, ARRL exam prep uh, question app. This is on the iPads, so iOS. You can get this on Android. And you, there's a free version, but the free version only allows you to do a 10-question test versus if you pay for it, then you can do the full uh, 35 test. So we're going to click on New Test here. Testing in progress. Yeah, you want to start a new test. We want to randomize. And do you want immediate feedback? Yes. And we do not want to auto advance. Auto advance uh, moves on to the next question. When you're first starting out, don't auto advance. If you're using the app, uh, make sure you understand why it is that that question is the question. So we're going to say no. So, hmm. Good beer. And hey, before I before I go any further, I want to remind everybody, go to the, the links in the description of the video. Get your hand on this technician class book. It's what we're looking at. You can go back to last week's video. It's it's relatively inexpensive, and the guy who makes it, Gordo, is a really awesome ham radio operator. And actually, really quick, before I before I go any further, um, here's another screen. This is YouTube, obviously. And I'm looking at the Twit network specifically ham nation ham nation is a video show about ham radio and it's on the twit network which is uh, owned and operated by leo laporte who's from the tech tv days fixture tv he also does uh, pc repair audio radio stuff on kfi like every sunday i think anyway the reason i'm mentioning is ham nation is this really good video show they do it i, I think they do it i don't know if they're live but they definitely put it on youtube and uh, they have a podcast that goes along with it, and Gordo's on it, and Gordon West is on it, along with a lot of other really, really smart people. I mean, you can see there, um, right now, this episode is on antenna analyzers, but they go through all these different segments. They cover news. They talk about um, the ham radio news program, which is like a weekly or bi-weekly news podcast and also bulletin system on ham radio really cool video so that's a shout out to that but let's let's go back to the app so anyway yeah go get the book the book's really good because it gives you a good primer a get a good um background on ham radio now if you wanted to then go and so a lot of questions i got from the last video the last video was you know this, these books are great but it, it kind of is a focus in getting you licensed and that's true because the questions are kind of esoteric a lot of them are esoteric and they don't really they don't really help you learn any more about ham radio. So if you can't find a club or, or maybe you're apprehensive about going out and meeting people, a really good uh, reference other than YouTube videos like mine is the ARRL Handbook. Really good. It's uh, $45 on Amazon. And I how many pages is this thing? It's huge, though. And they produce it every year. Now, for a long time, the Emory, uh, the uh, Amateur... 1,200 pages. For a long time, uh, back in the 90s, <clears throat> the, the book was not that great. It was really good back in the day, and then it started getting worse, and the quality's just come way back. So 
if you're at all interested in that, it's a really good book to have. So check that out. All right, how are we doing? Let me go back to my back to what I got going on here. Okay, so we're back on the app. All right, so what should be done to ensure that? Oh, am I? There we go. Ensure that voice message traffic containing proper names and unusual words are copied correctly by the receiving station. Uh, the entire message should be repeated at least four times. Such messages must be limited to no more than 10 words. Such words and terms should be spelled out using a standard phonetic alphabet. All of these choices are correct. So there's not, you, you can you can see that all those kind of sound like right answers, right? Um, I would be inclined to say C. Such words and terms be spelled out in standard phonetic alphabet. Um, and specifically, because they're only mentioning proper names and unusual words, right? They're only mentioning the words. So saying that the message should be repeated, the entire message should be repeated at least four times, that seems wasteful. Um, such messages be limited to no more than 10 words. Uh, it could be. Uh, I've, I'm not actually involved with, with voice message traffic. There's actually a system that does this. And it was used recently for the Puerto Rican uh, hurricanes. What happens is messages are collected, messages are collected, and they are uh, distributed via HF to try and get to Puerto Rico, where then someone takes a VHF handy talkie, and then that's how they get the message to where it's going. So we're going to say C. C was correct. See, this is I mentioned this in the last the last class that all of the above choices are sometimes not right. So be careful. So we'll go next. What type of modulation is most commonly used for VHF packet radio transmissions? Any ideas? So spread spectrum. AM, amplitude modification, FM, frequency modulation, or SSB, which is single sideband. Single sideband is most often used for HF, particularly um, voice, and it's used in, basically it, it takes AM and it uses one of the side lobes, either the upper or lower side, and that's where it puts the voice data. So it says VHF packet radio, so I'm inclined to say FM. Your radios, your handy talky radios, primarily work all on FM. Very few of them work on any other uh, mode other than FM. Ooh, come on. C was the correct answer. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. If you get any questions, go ahead and post your, your questions on, on how these are coming up, and I'll be happy to answer them. How might you obtain a list of active nodes that are using VoIP, that use VoIP? Um, okay, so from the local repeater frequency coordinator, from, the, from your local emergency coordinator, from the FCC rulebook, and from a repeater directory. Uh, okay, so uh, the FCC rulebook is just a list of rules. So it's not going to be C, most likely, right? A repeater directory is probably not going to do that because it's it depends on when it's going to be updated. And then from a local repeater frequency coordinator or from your local emergency coordinator. Um, I am inclined to go B, emergency coordinator. It could be A, but I'm going to go with B. No, it's D. From the repeater directory. Okay, so why? Um, I'm not really sure. I would hope that the D repeater directory would give you whatever it had in the current information. I know most repeater directories I have seen are printed, and you know you go buy it, you go to the ham radio outlet, and they have a repeater directory there. And um, so hopefully that information is good. Yeah, you're you're all correct in the chat. It was D from a repeater directory. So I got that one wrong. But remember, you only have to be 75% to pass your test. Which of the following meets the FCC definition of harmful interference? Static from lightning storms? Radio transmissions that annoy users of a repeater? Unwanted radio transmissions that cause costly harm to radio station apparatus? 
uh, that which seriously degrades, obstructs, or repeatedly interrupts a radio communication service operating in accordance with the ha with radio regulations. So um, I want to say B, uh, sorry A, static from lightning storms. Static though, not specifically a lightning strike. Hmm. So you could say C, unwanted ra unwanted radio transmissions that cause costly harm to radio station apparatus. Harm. Harmful, right? Harm was used in the answer. Harmful was used in the question. Um, radio transmissions that annoy B, that's, that's bad, but it's not harmful. And that which seriously degrades, obstructs, or repeatedly interrupts a radio uh, communication service operating in accordance with radio regulation. So C or D are both very compelling. D is compelling because it's so long, right? What do we say about long? Long is usually a, a, a place to start thinking. If it's very long, you might want to start thinking, hey, this is probably, probably something that could be interesting. Hmm, what do we want to do? Unwanted radio. So it says harm, though. So I'm inclined to say C. Hmm, looks like we've got split... Uh, split group in the chat. Guys, if at any time you have a question, please feel free to ask it. Uh-oh, we're split. We've got somebody going D. We've got multiples D, one C. Hmm. Harmful interference. So the FCC, uh, I believe, has a clarification on what is considered spurious transmission or spurious interference and harmful interference. Not the same thing. What do we do? Oh, David Hagen, passed, passed my test last week. Okay, David, so I get to ask you a question then. Um, what is going to be the first radio you buy? You may already own a radio that you're, you're happy with and, and you're, you're going you're gonna to stick with that for a while, but what is the next radio you think you're going to upgrade to? Go ahead and post in the in the chat and I'll see it. Okay, so we got split, C and D. I'll be the tiebreaker. It says harm. Want to go with C? Oh... You guys said D are correct. So what does that tell us? Longer answers are correct. I haven't taken my uh, ham radio technician license since 2007, guys. So uh, you shouldn't feel bad. I'm a general, and uh, I consider myself pretty safe and adherent to the FCC rules as possible. So if you miss some, it's okay. All right, so what do we learn? Uh, you want to focus on sometimes long answers, and C uh, said harm question said harmful, but apparently the FCC considers more than just that in the answer. So that is a good note. Commit that to memory. What's next? Uh, what does the term writ mean? Uh, rectifier inverter test, receiver input tone, receiver incremental tuning, or remote input transmitter. Dave has a Baofeng UV5RTP. Very good. How about next? What's, what's the next radio you're going to buy? You're going to upgrade to something a little bit, uh, one of the top four or the Japanese four? Or are you going to stick with Baofeng? What do you think? I always, uh, so I, I'm an engineer by trade. And so when I get acronym questions, I start bleeding in acronyms from my work. RIT is sometimes a reduction in test or reduction in testing. Um, so I get these and I'm like, oh man. <laughs> RIT, receiver input tone jumped out at me initially. Remote input transceiver. Hmm. Receiver incremental tuning. Yeah? Rectifier inverter test. Hmm. So B or C. You jump out at me. <coughs> oh. I should probably put that in uh, in airplane mode. <laughs> no, I don't don't want that. I don't want B. Hold on. I'm trying to uh No. Oh, okay. Well C was correct, but that was the one I was trying to do. <laughs> uh let's go like that. Okay, now we're in uh airplane mode so we won't be bothered by messages so c was correct who got it luke and pastor so i'm i'm 
kind of mentally keeping track. Luke has been right on. Pastor has been right on. Looks like David, you also got it. So David's David's going to be our our uh, our backstop for these our truth serum because he just passed his test, so he better know, right? What electrical parameter is controlled by a potentiometer? Oh, Randy Freddle, tech license on June 1st, general license on November 2nd, extra license hopefully in a couple of weeks, Baofeng F8, F8HP, FH. Now what base station should I get? Any recommendations? Since you're a general, um, you the sky's the limit. Basically, you can go with any base station you want. And really, it's going to come up to cost and, and what you like doing. Um, right now, I have my I have my heart set on an ICOM 7300. I really, really want one. I want one really, really bad. It's a perfect size. It's not too big, not too small. 100 watts, got a lot of power. It's got a built-in power supply, built-in tuner. Uh, yeah, it's, it's resistance. Uh, resistance is what's con uh, controlled by a potentiometer. And if you remembered last week, we had that question. Hopefully these ones should be easy for you. Stuff like this, stuff like this should be, um, they're very easy to remember, but you, you do have to commit it to memory, right? So make sure you do read the book, you go through some of these things and, and do the work to commit it to memory. Oh, this should be, this should be really easy. What does the abbreviation RF refer to? A reflective force in antenna transmission lines, resonant frequency of a tuned circuit, radio frequency signals of all types, or real frequency transmitted. So this is a freebie. Let's see. RF. So Randy, really what it comes down to is radios are, um, they can be really expensive. Really expensive. And the ham radio, or uh, the Icon 7300 is no excuse. That's a, depending on where you buy it from, it's a... $1,200 to $1,400 radio. Um, you could go QRP. You could go pure QRP and you could you could spend $1,200 getting a Elecraft KX3. Hell, I believe you can spec out a KX2 to be $1,200. So, and that only puts out 5 to 10 watts. Ham radio can get expensive, particularly when you start getting into HF. Um, there are... There are lots of ways to go, though, to keep it cheap. Oh, let's go to the next one. I'll let you guys read while I'm, while I'm talking, blathering on. Uh, the best ways to keep it cheap are buy used. Uh, join a club. Find out when uh, there's a ham radio swap meet. Go to the swap meet. Buy used. Buy in an old boat anchor. Yeah, Luke, Luke said, I like big radios. Big radios, boat anchors, old radios. There's all kinds of stuff that was made in the 80s that are uh, that do single sideband, uh, do CW, and that's probably all you need, at least to, to get to get out there on HF. And you can get amps for relatively inexpensive prices at swap meets. What you'll find is that you will probably have to commit to learning how to solder and how to maintain your radios when you go with those kind of things. Uh, the 7300 is a digital signal processing radio. It's a software-defined radio. So you, it's a whole nother beast, whole nother beast. If you want to stick to something analog, then shoot for something older. Now, I can't, I can't give you a good recommendation there because I don't have any boat anchors. I didn't really have the space when I was uh, younger in California. I only now live in a home, my home, where I can start collecting larger radios but um uh, Pecola pilot i need to find cheaper hobbies maybe gold collecting uh so that's also funny i i am a metal detectorist i spent a lot of time swinging a metal detector so um metal detectors are not cheap and obviously gold collecting gold is very expensive so what happens when the deviation of an fm transmitter is increased uh, signal occupies more bandwidth. Asymmetric modulation occurs. Its output power and bandwidth increases. So it's frequency modulation. Frequency is, right? Frequency, amplitude, frequency, yeah. Um, so its output power is not going to go up. 
more buttons is better. Yeah, I like that. Uh, it's output power and bandwidth increases. I'm going to go with that. C. No, it was A. Its signal occupies more bandwidth. Why? It's A. No, you're right, Luke. So who is... Again, Pastor and Luke, you guys have been right on. I don't know why I went with C. Um, so... It's okay to be wrong. <laughs> I'm wrong right now. I'm probably not even going to pass this test, and that's okay. We're, the reason you're doing this is so that you can commit to memory the right answer, and hopefully you get it wrong, and then you go look up why you were wrong. Why are we wrong? Okay, what happens when the deviation of an FM transmitter is increased? Its signal occupies more bandwidth. It's deviation of frequency modulation. So frequency is the the tops and bottoms of the wave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. In single side, so in single sideband, the output power and bandwidth increases. Yep. So its signal occupies more bandwidth. It's getting bigger. Yeah, wider bandwidth. Hopefully that makes sense. Which of the following devices or circuits changes an alternating current into a varying direct current signal? Uh, I believe that's a rectifier. AM, it would be D. Now I gotta go back. No, I'm not gonna go back. We only go forward. You got. You never go back. You can though. Um, you can go back if you get the app. And nothing wrong with that. The app is five dollars. I think it's a good. I think it's a good buy, for five dollars. It's hard to beat. Um, okay, so which of the following devices or circuits changes AC into a varying direct current signal? It's yeah, it's D. It's a rectifier. Anybody have any questions on why that is? It it just that's that's what it does. Again, these these are some things you kind of have to commit to memory. Rectifiers convert AC to DC. Varying DC uh, amplifiers amplify the power, and transformers also amplify the power. Somebody in the chat will correct me on that one. It's D. Come on, D. Come on, D. There we go. Which of the following is a common use of coaxial cable? So usually it's, yeah, it's, it's, Carrying RF signals between a radio and an antenna. You don't even need to mess with the other stuff. That's what we use coax for. Coax, our antennas live and die on coax. So make sure you buy the right coax for the job you're doing. Right? If it's a permanent installation, you want to get the right coax, you want to get the right connectors, you want to do the right waterproofing so that your coax doesn't fill up with water. Yes, that happens, and that kills your, uh, your standing wave ratio, your SWR, which is the meter of how efficient your antenna is performing based on the frequency that your radio is trying to get it to modulate at or attenuate. No, that's not the right word. Attenuate's not the right word. <clears throat> which is a good reason to use a regulated power supply for communications equipment? It prevents voltage fluctuations from reaching sensitive circuits. A regulated power supply has... So that may be true, but that's not the reason why things are FCC approved. Power consumption is independent of load. That is... Okay, sure, but why? That's not, that's not why you would do something. A fuse or circuit breaker regulates the power. So those are just statements. They're not actually answering the question, which is a good reason to use a regulated power supply. It's A, it prevents voltage fluctuations from reaching sensitive circuits. There you go. Okay, which of the following electronic components can amplify signals? Signals, multi-cell battery, variable resistor, electrolytic capacitor, or a transistor? Hmm. Which of the following electronic components can amplify a signal? I think the, uh, everybody's unanimous, multi-cell battery. Wait, 
What were you talking about? No. <laughs> so there's a lag there. <laughs> it's a transistor. <laughs> Look, can I can I cheat it and go back? Can I make a transistor? <laughs> it's D. Which of the following is a guideline to use when choosing an operating frequency for calling CQ? That's interesting. Uh, which of the following is a guideline to guideline? So things like guidelines are recommendations. They're not necessarily rules. They're not FCC mandates. They're guidelines. Sorry, my throat's. Yeah, I know I'm lagging out too. So sorry about that. <laughs> I like to have a combination of taking some of the answers from, from the chat and then which ones I know. And I, I wasn't even thinking about it. I just saw everybody going, Hey, and I was like, okay, hey, I don't care. Um, so again, guidelines, choosing an operating frequency for calling CQ, make sure you are on an assigned band, uh, listen first. So if, again, we've said, Hey, be careful when you pick all of your choices are correct. This one's correct to choose C because they're all like, yeah, these are all just good ideas. You should just do that. Why? Okay. Well, let's, let's walk through them. A, make sure you're, you are in your assigned band. You should not be transmitting on a band that has nothing to do with your license or that you are not approved to be transmitting on. So, A, yeah, A. B, listen first to be sure that no one else is using the frequency. Absolutely. They say ham radio, I think, is like 90% listening, 80% listening, and 10 to 20% transmitting if you're lucky. Um, you will spend way more time listening. And in fact, I end up listening more on radios that don't even have transmit capability. I'm a big, um, I love shortwave radio. I love single sideband shortwave radio. So yeah, you're going to listen a lot. And then D, of course, you have to ask if the frequency is in use. Again, these are all guidelines. Guidelines. Remember when they throw that term out? That's how you know. Ooh, gassy beer. All these choices are correct. Which of the following can be used to transmit CW in the amateur bands? Uh, it's all of them? <laughs> so what are we saying here? How can you transmit CW? CW is continuous wave. Continuous wave is really just completing a circuit and letting go of said circuit in the appropriate amount of time to make dits and daws. You can do that with a keyboard. You can do that with a keyer. You can do that with a straight key. They're all correct. Yeah, and Luke, <laughs> going back to the previous question, which let me let me go back, let me go back for a second. Luke said specifically, please remember this one. Do all those things. <laughs> Do all of them. Uh, you want to make sure that you're you're on your right frequency, that you the frequency is not in use, and that um, and that no one else is obviously on on the frequency because the frequency could be quiet but still in use for something. So anyway, going back to CW, yeah, all of these are correct. How does RF radiation differ from ionized radiation, radioactivity? Um, 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 uh, uh, I believe... It's D. Um, because, so, RF radiation is not perfectly safe. That's B. RF radiation is limited in range to a few feet. That's not true. Uh, RF radiation does not have sufficient energy to cause genetic damage. Totally not true. That's what they call RF burns, uh, particularly in HF. If you don't have a properly grounded system, the ground will actually go through your radio into the chassis and you can, you can burn yourself with RF waves. So that is not true. What do we, uh, oh, so we're getting a RF RF radiation does not have sufficient energy to... So we're talking about radiation. So I want to make sure I'm not going to get this one wrong. <laughs> it looks like everybody's going C, so I, I will change my answer. I was going to say... Yeah, dosimeter is not really going to do anything for you, though. B is not true. That's true. It's not... Radiation is heat damage. Got it. Genetic damage. Okay, there you go. You're not going to mutate yourself from radiation. RF radiation. You get that? So, uh, 
like atomic radiation will cause genetic damage because you are radiating your cells. RF will not do that. But you can still burn yourself. You can still hurt yourself, so be careful. What is component six in figure TC? That is a capacitor. Yes, I'm pretty sure that's true. Res resistor. All right, we're tapping into the big beer now. <laughs> so good question, Luke. I don't know if there is an RF dosimeter. Oh, okay. So actually, I didn't mention it. What am I drinking? The Golden Carlos Noel. This is a Belgian ale. It is 10.5% uh, by volume. There's a reason why I got this glass, so I could look at this beautiful beer. Look at that. You know what goes great with beer? Ham radio. Ham radio goes great with beer. So, what is... What is figure six in TC? It is a capacitor. One direction in. They're one way. Um, capacitors. So that's what the little arced line is showing you. The one way direction of a capacitor. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what an RF dose a meter is. Condensers. There you go. Okay, capacitor. What is the radio horizon? The distance over which two stations can communicate by direct path. The distance from the ground to a horizontally mounted antenna. The farthest point you can see when standing at the base of your antenna. The shortest distance between two points on the Earth's surface. The distance over which two stations can communicate by direct path. The distance from the ground. So radio horizon. Horizon, like where the sun comes up, right? The horizon, or where the sun sets. The farthest point you can see when standing at the base of your antenna tower, that would be line of sight. Radios can communicate much further than... Ooh, that beer's not that great. Ooh. It's got kind of a medicine-y taste to it. Ooh. Well, the answer, I, I believe, is A. Let me just get that out of the way right now. A is right. Why is the rest of them not right? The distance from the ground to a horizontally mounted antenna. Uh, horizontal versus vertical, while they have different antenna, uh, their, what do you call that? their effectiveness or where they resonate and the, the lobes at which they communicate and where there are dead spots. That's not the horizon. That's just the, the realities of that antenna. Uh, see the farthest point you can see. Again, that's line of sight. That means nothing to radio. Uh, maybe VHF, UHF. The shortest distance between two, between two points on the Earth's surface. That, again, that's meaningless. It's like as the crow flies kind of crap. Uh, how does current flowing through the body cause a health hazard okay you got by heating tissue all of these choices are correct it causes involuntary muscle contractions it disrupts the electrical functions of cells this is heat 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 i don't know man the cola pilot i've had some bad beers man <laughs> I've had some bad beers that I can't even finish. This one is is strikingly close to not being finishable. Um, I'll, I'll probably save. Is it B? Oh, current. I was thinking RF. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's all of them. <laughs> See? Read the questions. Or have a live stream with you when you're taking your test. Yeah, of course. Current current meaning if you grab a live wire you can you, your hand can close that's why it always says test this way actually test at the a uh 
a device that checks for EMF. Don't just touch things. Yep. And it, yeah, like a taser, right, will drop you because it's disrupting the electrical pass and, of course, by heating. So there you go. No, no, no. Babaki, no. <laughs> so we've already proven that twice on this stream and twice on the previous stream. When, uh, Whenever all the above is a question, that's the answer is not true at all. And RTFQ is the right answer. Read the F in question. Yeah, absolutely. Read the F in question. Uh, yeah, so please, Babaki. Uh, I hope I'm saying that right. Is it Babaki? Uh, Babaki. It sometimes is put there on purpose to trip you up. The All the answers are right. Um, there's only been, There's been two where they're not right. Just today. All right. How soon after passing the examination for your first amateur radio license may you operate a transmitter on an amateur service frequency? This one is very easy, very nice to remember. It's D. As soon as your operator station's license grant appears... This is also a gassy beer. Whew. No, Babaki, also, that's not true. <laughs> I, no offense, dude, no offense. I'm saying that the percentage-wise... It's probably flat. It's probably 50-50, if not favoring it not being the right answer. So anyway, going back to this one, as soon as you see your uh, license in the FCC license database, you can transmit to your heart's content. So who did we... Did, was that Biker Bob? Biker Bob, man. How are you doing, bud? I haven't talked to you guys in a long time. In fact, I may... Uh, I, I, as long as Leia doesn't... So she's graciously letting me do these chats, which I, I very much appreciate. Um, but if she gives me some time, I'm going to end up going over to gunchannels.com. So if anybody wants to continue some discussions over there, that's probably where I'll he be heading over. You should go over there anyway. There's a bunch of good guys. Um, oh, yeah, you're playing the waiting game. Where are you, uh, where are you at state-wise, David? All right. <laughs> Under what circumstances is it safe to climb a tower without a helper or observer. So, never is always the right answer for these kind of things. Yeah. So the the way that the streams work and it's out of my control is I can't really I can't really control how much lag we have. We have a lag of about a second in between this video and the sound to my computer. But what goes into YouTube, I I think I might be able to reduce. In fact, let me see if I can do that. Yeah, I don't think so. So, uh, of course, the, the the FCC and the test is going to say do the safest thing. Uh, you can generally predict the answer to a question. Just do the safest thing. And the safest thing is just don't. If, if you don't have, if you don't have uh, someone to be a spotter, don't go. So, never. Hey, that's right. What is the approximate amount of change measured in decibels of a power increase from 20 watts to 200 watts? So these are some of those, like, I won't... What's the best way to put this? You're probably not going to use this. <laughs> um, you're, you're probably not going to use this right in the beginning of your, your radio career, your hobby life. Um, I'm not even sure I know the answer to this. I'm wanting to believe it's A, 10 dB. But, um, I'm sure we'll get, we'll get a core, we'll, we'll get a quorum before we go forward. This is one of those things where you kind of have to remember there's some limited math in, in the technician test. There's a lot more math in the general test. I actually had to take some notes down. I normally don't, there's no, I don't think you need to have notes you know, that like paperwork that you work on for the technician license, you should just be able to slam this out. I, I think it's DB, uh, 10 dB. We got two. Pastor, Pastor Andy. I'm going with Pastor Andy. That's right. It's 10 dB. Electrical current is measured in which of the following units? Watts. 
What you say? Right? Current. Amps? No, amps. Right? Amps. Yeah, 10 long, so 2020 is 200. Or you take 200 divided by 20, and that gives you the dB. So current, what's the, uh, current is what kills you? How do we measure current? In amps? Is that right? <laughs> I'm asking this to, like, I, I think that's right. A lot of these... Is it? Yeah, it's it's amps. So again, Pastor seems to have his 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 stuff dialed in. So current kills you. Right? Current is what stops your heart. Current is what they use in defibrillators. Current is it's the juice, right? So that's amps. We measure that in a amps. Mark Aaron, how you doing? I am doing well, very well. Thank you for asking. I just tried to use my mouse to click on the screen. That's funny i have to click on the actual ipad ants was correct where is an rf pre-amplifier installed between the antenna and the receiver at the output of the transmitter's power amplifier at the receiver's audio output between a transmitter and an antenna tuner so a preamp would imply before the amplifier. So what does that mean? At the output of the transmitter's power amplifier, that means out of the amplifier, that's not before, between a transmitter and a tenna tuner, mm, no, probably not, between the antenna and the receiver. So that's very broad, right? Antenna, antenna and receiver antenna and receiver at the output of the transmitters power amplifier yeah no it's a for all the reasons we covered at the receivers audio output receivers audio output no it's pre amplified so you're pre amplifying what's coming in or out to an amplifier between a transmitter and antenna tuner, that would not make any sense. You don't want to do that. Between an, between an antenna and a receiver. Come on. There we go. A. For those that are uh, just joining or that have been joining that weren't here in the beginning, let me cover this quick, quickly. Um, I'm sick. I have a cold. And while I can talk okay, I yesterday and the day before was horrible for me. So I didn't do enough of the research that I wanted to do continuing on in the book. So we're going to do that next week. Um, if you haven't already got the book, now's a great time. Take some of that Christmas money and throw it into one of the uh, great Gordo books. Give him some, some love because he deserves it. He puts out a really good book. And by the way, everybody that's watching this, you have until June 2018 to get your technician license. The pool's going to change. The questions are going to be similar. They add some new questions. They take some questions out. But still, very important that you know the question pool that you're dealing with. And that's what we're doing. Ooh, gassy beer. Okay, which of the following is an acceptable language to, to use for station identification? Very important to note, station identification. When operating a phone subband. It's English. Only English. You could speak any language recognized by an FCC agreed nation right in regards to uh to ham radio but you you use english for your call sign come on there it is see yeah so you can use english as your call sign and then go right back to um to speaking whatever the native languages or the language of your contact what term is commonly used to describe the rapid fluttering sound sometimes heard from the mobile stations that are moving while transmitting picket fencing is it picket fencing flip-flopping hmm. i don't think so no c was the last question i believe it's picket fencing you're not frequency shifting while transmitting 
Rapid fluttering sounds sometimes heard from mobile stations that are moving while transmitting. Yeah, it's picket fencing. Okay. Kaha. See, I do remember my test. <laughs> what electrical differences exist between the smaller RG58 and the larger RG8 coaxial cables? Mmm. This is one of those things where you just have to commit it to memory. RG58 cable has less loss at a given frequency. RG8 has less loss at a given frequency. The reverse. There is no significant difference between the two types. RG58 can handle higher power levels. If you're driving, if you're driving fast, um, yeah. So Luke, th that's a really good tangent discussion. Um, Doppler shift is the most prevalent if you're ever trying to work low Earth orbit satellites. And what that means specifically, and I, I believe this might be set up for SO50. Let me see if it is. Don't mind me. I don't think it is anymore. Oh! No, it's not. Oh, there it is. Okay, so... Um, I can I can show this to you live on my on my the the Doppler is actually important though and I'm, I I know you're kidding but um, th it's actually a good little tangent that when you're receiving from a payload a satellite payload and it's it's hauling ass like really hauling ass you do have to account for the Doppler shift and so what they'll generally do and and it says let me show it. where's that. So it says 50, and it says 3 and 4, 4, 3, 2, 1, mid, which is basically overhead, going back to mid, mid's overhead, negative 1, 2, 3 is just going away. So you do, yeah, 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 but it's important. So. I know you were joking, you, but you have to be hauling ass, and satellites haul ass. So, anyway. So, uh, what's the difference? It, it kind of it kind of gives you the answer somewhat. So, going back to the question. It kind of gives you the answer in the question itself. It mentions is smaller versus larger. RG8 is, yeah, well, it was a fancy radio until I, like, kicked it down my driveway and scratched the whole face on it. I love this radio, though. Not very robust. It's not Yesu robust, that's for sure. It's also fatty. It's pretty fat. I don't think it's got refined looks to it. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I'll tell you what, when I go on my walks in the evening, I, I generally always take a Baofeng. I don't take my, my, uh, my Kenwood. So, um, they say in the question, RG58 is smaller, larger RG8. Which would have the smaller loss? Well, the one that had the most distance between the shielding and the uh, the driven element. Okay, so B. Oh, my iPad shut down. Eight, RG eight. Which of the following precautions should be taken when measuring high voltage with a voltmeter? <laughs> uh. Ensure the circuit is grounded through the voltmeter. Mm, that's a way. Ensure the voltmeter and leads are rated to use at voltages to be measured. That makes sense, does it not? So yeah, when I bought this radio, it was five hundred dollars. Um, you know that YouTube money. You know that YouTube money, my guys, my my bros, my allies. No, I, seriously though, I, I'm an engineer. I make good money. I work hard. I I. I Throw it around every once in a while. <laughs> uh, in <laughs> very low impedance, ensure the volt oh, the voltmeter has very low impedance so that it shorts the shit out of it as fast as possible. Ensure that the voltmeter is set to the correct frequency. Yeah, it's, okay. It, it's really simple. the The higher the voltages that a voltmeter can handle, you pay a lot more for. Like, if you want a really good voltmeter that can handle high voltages, they're generally really expensive. So, it's B. 
What is an amateur station control point? This is one of those like, this is one of those questions. I don't, I don't really like these kind of questions. The location at which the control operator function is is performed. Okay, the location of the station's transmitting antenna. That's like, seems right. Like I like B, then switch it to amps. There you go. The mailing address of the station's licensee. Well, I hope not because I uh, have my call sign goes to a PO box. So hey, the location of the station's transmitting apparatus. Well, that's I like D. Oh, well, okay. So again, read the question. What is the question saying? Where is the control point? The control point of the transmitting apparatus. That's not the transmitting apparatus. I could have a computer running software to run a software-defined radio that could be out in another away building where my antenna, closer to the, ten the antenna, and I just use Ethernet. So it's A, where the control operator function is performed. So there's that, there's that take a second and, and read the question, or the read the F in question, which was the comment earlier. So where are we at? We're at 25, 29 questions. Uh-oh. This is where the FCC starts getting nasty and they start dumping out part 15, part this, part that. What is a part 15 device? You know what? It's not a Baofeng. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Actually, I think that might actually be true. I don't think that they qualify for part 15. An unlicensed device that may emit low-powered radio signals on frequencies used by a licensed service. A type of amateur radio that can legally be used in the citizen's band. Um, that might be B. A type of test set used to determine whether a transmitter, a transmitter is in compliance with FCC regulation. A device for long-distance communications using special codes sanctioned by the International Radio Union. It's B. Right? It's B. Is it B? Is it B? <laughs> Pastor says A, so I'm scared. An unlicensed device that may emit low-powered radio signals on frequencies used by a licensed service. Oh, Luke says A. So with those two, you know it's got to be right. So I'm going to go with A as well. Here we go. It was A. I really wanted it to be B, but... You know, that, that's part of the not remembering the FCC part, numbered, uh, all that goodness. So, you know, something to remember. What formula is used to calculate a voltage in a circuit? Voltage E equals current I divided by resistance. Voltage E equals current minus R, uh, I minus R resistance. Voltage equals current I multiplied by resistance. That's not right. Voltage equals current added to resistance. That's not right. So what is it? It's either minus or divided. Minus or divided. What would make more sense? In this case, it, it's probably divided by. It looks like we have a... Uh-oh. Nope. Nope. See, there's that lag. Now I'm getting the mad lag again. Hmm, pastor. Pastor. Are you saying C, pastor? Voltage equals current multiplied by resistance? That can't be right. I thought it was divided by resistance. Okay, we're not going to count this one against you, but I'm going A. Unless you're right, then you double down. So you get extra points. A. No, he was right. He was right. Pastor was right. Why is that? Okay, wait, wait. Why is that? Voltage equals current multiplied by resistance. Why am I missing such an elementary <laughs> equation? Voltage equals current multiplied by resistance. Volts in a circuit. Oh, in a circuit. See, this is that you got to read the damn question. Or the F in question. Hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, so let's walk this back. What formula is used to calculate voltage in a circuit? In a circuit where the power is being held based off of where your power supply is and your components and what you're driving. You have to factor in resistance to that. See, again, don't, don't try to do a live stream while trying to answer these questions, I guess. I'm probably not going to pass this. I think, yeah, pastor, pastor should uh, just, just go with whatever pastor says. Yeah, just go with him. <laughs> Which amateur band are you using when your station is transmitting on, it's two meters, 146.52. 146-point-anything is the two-meter band. 20-meter uh, band is 14. I don't know, 6, and I don't use 14. But it's definitely not two-meter. So, Pastor, uh, by the way, for the last question, Pastor gets double points. I have to put another, I have to like figure out where I can fit a scoreboard or something like that on the uh, behind me here. E equals I times R. Yep, there you go, guys. Anyway, two meter band is correct. What type of antenna are the quad, yagi, and dish? These are directional, directional antennas. Um, I used to have one hanging behind me that I made out of a tape measure that I bought from Harbor Freight. They're like a roof antenna, but instead of being like arrow shaped, they're they're flat. They're flat, right? And how they work, it's really interesting. Only one element, the two elements, are driven. It is actually where your anode and your cathode is. Anode and... Anyway. <laughs> it's basically a dipole with extra pieces that focus where you want the energy to go. The largest part of a directional antenna is your reflector. And then you have the focusing elements that drive it forward is b what does the pastor say okay pastor b directional antenna <laughs> what type of amateur station can automatically retransmit the signals of other amateur stations the wait, what, what type of earth uh i don't know about earth i don't know about auxiliary Beacon, repeater, or station, uh, space station. That seems like the only one. Isotropic antennas are hard to mount. <laughs> so there's, there's, um, in these questions, there's some stuff that, like, gets in the way from it being the right answer. Um, uh oh, pastor says B. Look, a beacon is not retransmitting, right? A beacon is just a tone. Right? Tell me, Pastor. Tell me. A beacon's a tone, right? That you just can pull up the frequency for and listen. You just listen to a beacon. You're not actually... Well, now I want to know what the hell an auxiliary station is. What is an auxiliary station? I'm going to switch over right now. Flat out. Fix it, Google. Uh, the FCC says that if a radio station is used, the station where the control commands are performed is an auxiliary station. An auxiliary station is an amateur radio station transmitting communications point to point within a system of cooperating amateur stations. Pastor's right again. It's B. See, that was a good one because I thought it was D2. I was like D beacon, but then the more you think about it, you're like, okay, well, what are beacons? Beacons are like a, they're, they're transmitting a tone or the time or, or something that is not rebroadcasting. It's not like, it's not furthering down the line, right? Re, like taking in a signal, amplifying it, and re, retransmitting it. Very good. We're in the home stretch. What property of radio waves is often used to identify the different frequency bands? The appropriate wavelength, or the approximate wavelength is probably the right answer. The time it takes for waves to travel one mile. The voltage standing wave ratio of waves. Now, the magnetic intensity of waves. 
What property of radio waves is often used to identify the different frequency bands? We've already said this. It was 20 meter, 2 meter, 40 meter, 6 meter, the approximate wavelength. Blad out, Pastor said. You're on your own, buddy. A is correct. <laughs> Who may be the control operator of a station communicating through an, am an amateur satellite or space station? Who may be the control operator of a station communicating through an amateur satellite or space station? Only an amateur extra class operator who has also an AMSAT member. No. Oh, can't see the iPad. Thanks. There you go. Yeah, so let me go back. There you go. <laughs> what property of radio waves is often used to identify the different frequency bands? The approximate wavelength. Fixed it. Sorry, now you can all see it. That's what happens when I have a lot of scenes here on my live stream uh, console. So you got to be careful with this one because it depends on what the satellite is operating on. And this is like, this calls out, this calls out like uh, specific classes of license, an extra class, an extra class, a general class. Three out of the four questions all qualify a class of operator. And again, pastor is correct. Any amateur whose license privileges allow them to transmit on the satellite uplink frequency. Now, I, I want to be very specific when I, you know, I like satellites a lot. That's what I do for, for, for business. Um, your satellite could uplink on a technician class frequency and transmit on a general class frequency. I'm not saying they do or there's any that exist that way, but there's no reason that they couldn't. And there's no reason that, that any radio could not also do that. So keep that in mind. It's B. All right. Is that it? Oh. Okay. I passed. Congratulations. We just got our technician class license. You got 30 out of 35 questions correct. So that's not that's not a good showing. When I did my technician class license, I didn't miss any. Um, but you can do this. We just did this. We had fun, right? We had fun. We're going to do things different next week uh, for sure. But this is this is all you got to do. You just pull up the app. Have the actually read the book. R read the book. Go read the book. Go read this book. And there, a lot of the things I want to I want to point out something. Let me let me find one of them. I don't know if this is going to be a good example, but um, so there. One of the best things about these books is these ham hints. That guy's got an E on his shirt because he's an Elmer. This one says um, many weak op many weak signal operators use CW on the bottom of the two meter subband to bounce signals off the moon and off of auroras. Here for yourself all the excitement of Mound Boons, Aurora, and Long Haul tropos Tropospheric Ducting, sorry, my, my throat is killing me. Oh, it's getting all backed up. Uh, in the audio CD included in the front of the book, there's a lot. Okay, well, that's that's fun, but that's not a good one. Let me go deeper in here. Jesus. This is all telling me to go look at the, the book or the, the CD. Yeah, I got the CD. Anyway, go read it because they do include a lot of cool pictures. And I don't mean that like, oh, the pictures are great. Like, it's actually explanational on, like, what they're used for and the use of those things. So I think my radio is even in here a bunch of times. That uh, B-72. Yeah, there it is. I found it. I found my radio. Not my radio specifically, but the same, same model. Kenwood. Kenwood just came out with a new version of this. So, all right. Um, Leia's not home. So, everybody, congratulations. We can go for a little bit longer. Uh, any questions? Do you have any questions for the uh, for the uh, the chat? I'm going to get off the... There we go. Off the iPad. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, um, to pick a winner. I think it's a tie between Luke and Pastor for questions answered. 
Although Pastor probably wins because I did the double down where he got double points. So <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, party time. Ham radio questions. Oh, I was going to... um. I can't remember who it was. I wanted to talk more about CW. And I was, I was, I got into a discussion with, uh, there's a ham radio Facebook group. Actually, it's kind of funny. There's a couple people who saw my face, but, um, my, oh, Luke, you're out. Sorry. You're, you're second place. Pastor wins. Um, so, a couple of people recognize my face and they're like, oh my God, your videos, you're the one that, sent, that, that got me to get into Hammer. I was like, that's super cool. Like, I, I just, I get so much motivation from, from people telling me things like that. So I really appreciate it anytime you send me a message. But um, for sure, they ask the question of like, well, what's going to happen to CW? And I never understood this. Like, I never understood why people were so, their heartstrings were so connected to CW. On one hand... We don't need CW to qualify to get a technician, a technician license. It'd be nice if you could, but there's no reason. The reason why CW is still awesome and still around is because, on the other hand, it's like the best for getting your signals out there. It's the best for making long-distance communications, particularly based on the power of your station. CW will go and go and go, and it can be... You can, you can almost hear it above the noise... Where a single sideband, you, you, it's it's gonna be gone. Um, there are thirty five questions on the actual technician exam. We did thirty five questions. It was just a sample, picking one question out of the different sections. Um, uh, CW stands for continuous wave. So that's Morse code or American Morse code that was used in like uh, for trains and stuff like that. That was a um, different thing. It's not the same as, as CW we use in, in amateur radio. Uh, Luke, you're you're full of funny comments. The very cool keys probably help. Yeah, there are, man, keys are expensive. So I, I came up on this at a swap meet. It's an MFJ um, multi-band CW transceiver. And what it does is it's pretty interesting. It it, it supports multiple uh, bands, but the way it does it is with these cards that you, you pull out a card and put the other card in. So you can just set it to like 20 or 40 meters and then just leave it. But I picked this up at a swap meet for about 100 bucks, and um, with two different frequency cards, it's got rechargeable batteries in it. And if you tune an antenna, like a wire antenna to this, and, and bring out a couple of counterpoises, you, you can transmit on this, no problem. You just have to learn CW, which is the trick. Um, CW is good for lots of things, but the most useful stuff is going to be repeaters. You're going to, you're going to, I guess it depends on where you live. So I, I'm, it's always tough for me to like tell people what their radio realities are going to be like. Because you may live in the boondocks, and if you live in the boondocks, then like you're probably not going to hit a repeater, and you're going to want to get to HF faster than than anyone. For me, um, I've got stations all over the place. I, I I'm in Southern California, and I you I I've got a mobile radio, uh, does fifty watts. I don't even need that, and I can shoot out to the islands, uh, Catalina Island, some of the other islands off of the California coast. And it can hit all the repeaters. The repeaters are everywhere. Um, so I'm. It your your radio realities will be different from everybody else. But one radio reality that's kind of true anywhere is that CW is going to be very beneficial if you have any interest in doing low power communications QRP, or perhaps you want to get in, involved in SOTA summits on the air, or you have uh, these amazing DX aspirations. CW is going to do DX better than single sign band on most situations. Uh, Babaki says, ever use ham study? I have not. But then he says, it will give you explanations for answers. So that's very helpful. That That's very helpful. In, in fact, I, I find that I'm able to retain things better if I kind of know why, not just shut up and remember this. So that that's good. 
Um, two meter. So Luke said, I've talked over 100 miles on two meters. Yeah, you, you can. You absolutely can. I don't know what kind of antenna he had, but I know people who, um, they, they have a two meter race. I call it a race car rig. The hunt, you know, so many watts of power that they that they blast into these two meter radios on directional antennas to try and like out to talk over people on repeaters um that's that's a reality that that's that's a violation of of ham radio rules but it's a reality it's a thing that happens so you know it is what it is um Picola Pilot, I listened to my local repeater. Annoying. They talk about what they had for breakfast and when their next doctor's appointment is. Yeah, so um, you're going to find that's that's going to be universal pretty much no matter where you go. There's going to be some frequencies on HF that are just going to be rag chew frequencies that you're just going to... They're going to be active, but it's just going to be a lot of people communicating and talking. They may be just talking over greater distance. Oh, yeah, I don't know what the Great Lakes do for propagation. I know that um, in California, we have a lot of beaches that have um, parks that are on the top of a cliff, and the cliff just falls into the Pacific Ocean, and that allows for great communication um, west to, like, Japan and whatnot. It's like having an antenna on top of a, you know, thousand-foot mast, and that's just, you know, <laughs> that's amazing. Who we still got in here? We lost some people, but um, keep the questions coming if you have anything. Oh, man. Um, yeah, so if you don't want to do repeaters... Well, if you don't want to do repeaters, there's a couple things you can do. Um, you can join a club that does things other than repeaters, and there's tons of them. There are things like uh, fox hunts, direction finding... It's a, an, it's basically a sport of radio. There's soda, summits on the air. A lot of people use HF rigs for summits on the air. In fact, I have two. I've got that little CW rig that you saw, and I have an LNR LD5, which is a five, uh, five frequency, five wave radio that um, that I use for that. I have a couple different antennas I use for that. I have uh, N fed antennas, random wire N fed antennas. I have tuned antennas. Actually, I, I do. I'll show you this. This is a fun little project right here. This is a fun project. I'll do a video on this in the future. Here is a chalk line. Okay? So I've got an insulator, dog bone insulator with a wire that I can twist onto anything. And then there's the feed line to the... To what... I just have an alligator clip on there now. But you can pull out your antenna and I have the wire marked um, at different tuning levels. I took an, a, an antenna analyzer and went through and marked all these areas up depending on a frequency that I wanted to to talk on. So now I have a, a an easy to use antenna that may not be perfectly matched depending on how high I get it off the ground or whatnot. But um, a great little project, and it's and it's a relatively small, small package that winds itself up. Uh, P Cola Pirate, man, I I uh, I don't know how many of you guys follow Captain Burrs. Captain Burrs is an old YouTube friend of mine, going back to I don't know 2008, 2009. Captain Burrs did a video not too long ago on making a Faraday cage out of like a trash can. And he was talking about EMP and all that stuff. So here's my here's my uh, high level bullet on EMPs. When the EMP strikes, will all your equipment be destroyed? No. Um, will your most sensitive equipment be damaged? Maybe. Uh, there's just too many variables, and. That's not to say you shouldn't be prepared. That's not to say that you you can't get a, a bag, a cloth bag, put a put a bow fang in there with a rechargeable battery and maybe the charger for that battery. And put it in that a paint can and tape it shut. 
What's up, John Z? And there's your little mini Faraday cage, and I get that off the ground, but I, it doesn't matter. Ground's ground. Um, I am not a big proponent of the hysteria, because I am kind of in the prepper world, but I'm more of a prepper for earthquakes, prepper for civil unrest. I'm not so worried about the EMP as much as other people are. And I know it's like, well, it's crazy. You're a ham radio operator. Ham radios are so sensitive. They're going to be the first things down. That's not necessarily true. Um, there is a lot of misinformation regarding EMPs. What are those bags called? Oh, um, so how an EMP, so how a Faraday cage works. A Faraday cage takes energy, so if there's a wave or, or something that's energizing the cage, the cage dumps to ground and whatever is inside the cage is insulated by something. In this case, uh, a cloth bag, uh, a felt bag, anything that securely encloses the electronic component so that it doesn't touch and complete a circuit where it energizes. No, so that's not true either. So ice bomb, so, um, I don't want to. I don't want to spread misinformation, and I don't want to create hysteria. But at the same time, I don't want people to misunderstand what's going on here. So it doesn't matter if your radio is plugged in or not plugged in. What an EMP does, and I'll and I'll I'll try and use this as a prop. An EMP is a wave of energy that, when it hits, and actually it's three waves. An EMP wave is is three different waves: an alpha and a there's a middle and then a gamma wave. When it hits an electronic device, it energizes the, the lines, the feeds, the, the paths of that circuitry. And given the, the intensity of that wave, it can, uh, it can basically jump the paths and create shorts, electrical shorts. That's what a, sh that's what a short is. It's where you short to ground or you, or, or you, you, you cross your lines and you're feeding power the wrong way. Um, so <laughs> conventional wisdom tells you that if your radio is just sitting out in the open, it could be affected by an EMP. That is true because the EMP waves are still hitting it. You could build a Faraday cage, and the Faraday cage prevents all waves from hitting this. So I'm not saying yes or no that EMPs will damage everything. I'm saying that the textbook, the textbook idea of what an EMP is will affect this. The difference is, will it damage it? Uh, an EMP punches holes through the silicon layer in all the transistors. See, I don't, that doesn't mean anything to me. What a, what a EMP wave does is it energizes things that are, that conduct electricity. So it has nothing to do with transistors or anything like that. It's, it's the feed lines on the, the silicon board, any of the copper lines, anything like that get energized. And if that ener that, that wave that hits it is, is of enough power that it causes damage either by melting leads or destroying components, that's where the damage from an EMP would come from. Okay, I'm not saying that this will happen. I'm not saying this, this won't happen. I'm saying how the damage occurs is via the, the charging of that circuit, via the wave. Luke, my tower's been hit by lightning. EMP should be fine. Yeah, except you got grounding on your tower, right? I mean, the, your, the lightning went to ground. I'm guessing. I hope you don't ground through your station. You're gonna be, you're gonna have cancer. <laughs> so, Steve, your overall point is correct. Mm, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. Transistors do have a very small, um, thin layer of insulation that causes it to work as a transistor. I'm just, I'm less worried by it, to be honest with you. But again, 
no, there's no reason why I didn't. I, I, I like I said, I take the antenna off of this thing. All right, take the antenna off of it, put it in a little baggie with a charger for the battery, and I mean like a, a, a proper insulating baggie, not just like an, you you could get one of those. Uh, uh, what do they call those? ESD, yeah, electrostatic dispersion bags. You double up those bags, and that's basically like EMP resistant, and then slam that into a uh, one of those clean paint cans you can buy from Home Depot and bang the lid on it. You're good. No, EMPs are not directional, particularly the ones that they're, uh, oh, I'm sorry, they're omnidirectional. So if, okay, if we talk about doomsday, if somebody were to, to throw a nuke up into the high atmosphere and detonate it, that would create an EMP omnidirectional wave. The omnidirectional wave, uh, is it laggy my voice to my face or what's the lag? Um, I don't, so maybe for the gamma, so Steve, I think you're right. There's three waves to an EMP and for the gamma, you probably have to be line of sight, but the other uh, portions of the EMP wave, you, you might not have to be. And no, so it, it's not about frequency. It's about the power of the wave. And that power energizes the electronics and bam. There you go. Luke, it is grounded. I've got one beer and one ground rod pounded into the system. Has an EMP ever been deployed? Well, anybody can make anybody can make an EMP. You can create your own EMP generator, your own EMP field generator, which will knock out electronics. And actually, there, there's there's plans you can buy online that will actually kill electronics if you make it. Um, they use a lot of power, but you, you can you can do whatever you want. Um, but no, an EMP in the in the doomsday scenario has not been deployed in aggression. However, there was the, it's called the Starfish Prime. You can look that up. It was done in the Pacific Ocean by the Americans. And it was a, a low, I believe a low Earth orbit detonation of a nuclear bomb. And that had EMP effects all the way to Hawaii, I believe. Cool. I'm glad we sorted out your problems there, Pete Cold Pilot. Yeah, so we're we just past the hour mark, so that's awesome. I'm glad you guys are all sticking with me here. I'm, I'm also glad that we 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 dipped into the world of EMP. <laughs> Somehow this always comes up when you when you bring a bunch of preppers together and a bunch of radio enthusiasts. They all start talking about EMP. Like the, for some reason, that's the thing that all people we all meet there in the middle. Nothing wrong with that. Cheers, Danny boy. The beer, the beer is calling. All right, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna take a bio break. I'm gonna add I'm gonna add an ad. I'm gonna add an ad. Um, in the meantime, post in the chats any questions when I get back, and I'll and I'll wrap it up with that. So I'll be right back, guys. Thanks for watching. Appreciate you sticking around.
<laughs> so I come back and the, and the the only question I have is from Luke. And he asks, "Are Motorola users wankers?" Uh Motorola's are really expensive and I think there's a self worth that a lot of Motorola users tack onto those radios. They're great radios, um but I I think that if you have to spend an absorbent amount of money just to program the things and jump through crazy hoops to even make them work. Yeah. Everybody's here. We still have a pretty good amount of people watching right now. I, I think we just need something to talk about. CEO Campbell. CEO Campbell, I, I think this is the first time I'm seeing you in here. Where are you at? Oh. Um, I don't know why, so let me go back to, I don't know, six, six or seven minutes ago. Pete Cole, a pirate, uh, a pilot ask, are EMPs real? So yeah, they're absolutely real. And I'll go back there for a second. I don't know why, um, I don't know why it said held for review. I don't know what it was. It was a YouTube, the YouTube bugs, the YouTube bots got in there and thought you were asking something dirty, I guess. Um, yeah, EMPs are absolutely real. It is a real phenomenon. It, it, it's a wave that is produced by uh, an explosion of a high amount, in this case, an atomic bomb that's exploded in a higher part of Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, I wasn't going to say anything, Picola, but I figured you're from Pensacola. I figured. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Wife's coming home. We're going to have to wrap it up. <laughs> So, uh, so yes, they're real. Anyway, let me go forward to your next question. I travel for a living and I carry a lot of survival gear that is TSA approved. Yeah, good luck with that. I just sneak knives through TSA. You can go watch some of my videos. I've, I've done multiple videos where I, I just put lockback knives in my little uh, medicine bag for my to go. I was traveling constantly. Not as much as a pilot, but traveling all the time. If FHTF, what frequency would I use? I mean, the FCC would not exist. Just curious. Yes. So I have, y'all. Um, so you can go to my um, go to my emergencies communication one video, and I I posted a link to this little paper card that has frequencies on it. I just happen to laminate it. There's a lot. There's a lot of frequencies you can go to. Um, for for ham radio stuff when when an emergency happens uh, one such one is UHF 446.030 VHF 146.420 VHF 146.520 and VHF 146.550 all of those uh, are unofficial uh, frequencies that you can you can broadcast on. Broadcast. I I know people hate when I say broadcast. They hate it. They're like we are ham radio operators. We transmit. We don't broadcast. Like you can't see the difference there, bud. Is there a difference? <laughs> There's not much of a difference. Uh oh, they're having fun. They're back. That means we've got to end it, guys. I'm gonna close the door really quick and wrap up. Guys, thanks for thanks for watching so much. Really appreciate you watching. Again, if you have not, go look at the description. Technician class book. If you want to get your license, this is the, the starting point, the best way. If you kind of already know somewhat things about radio, then go download the app and just, just work the app. The app's five bucks. A-double-R-L. Work the app. We just did it. We passed. Um, does Alexa really work for the CIA? News lady said that today. Yeah, I think so. I think she's also transphobic or, or uh, no, no, the opposite. She's anti-conservative. I might do, uh, I might hop in the guns chat later, but I got to go take care of some family stuff. So anyway, I'll, I'm, I might be on gunchannels.com later. Thank you, everybody that tuned in. If you have not, please subscribe because what I'm doing is my, my work stuff has gotten so crazy that what I like to do is just schedule these live streams sit down with you guys it, it's uh it's scheduled you get it a day or two in advance and then we can have a little moment where we can talk which is so far been a lot of fun i'm having more fun doing this than 
than some of my other uh, vlogs in the past because we talk immediately. I don't have to do a bunch of editing. <laughs> um, and that's been fun. With that said, if you're not already also following us in uh, Swell Family, the Swell Family vlog, that's where most of the vlogging went to. We do it uh, once a week about. And when will you cover... Danny Boy Triple D, when will you cover General License? I... General license is 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 like a big step up, and then extra is another big step up. We will, but I really want to. I need to, to do some project videos. I mentioned that antenna tuner right there. Um, I've got some stuff I need to do with that. I actually need to put some antennas on my roof, and I need to start making some videos that will um, incentivize or or tease the taste of HF into you guys to want to upgrade from your technician. You're going to find that when you get your technician, what's going to happen is you're going to start, you're going to start talking to this thing. And you're like, Oh, this is boring. All right, I'm, I'm done. And then you're going to put the radio on the, the shelf. Well, what do I do then? I, I've got to get you to want to go to another part of radio. And what's the next part of radio? It's HF high frequency. The, the long talk, long destination, long distance. That's what we want. That's where we want to go. That's the meat and potatoes of ham radio, believe it or not. Uh, Daniel Hufford just bought radios for the whole fam. Thanks for your videos. Very informational. Keep up the good work. The only thing I ask is that you understand the legalities of what you're doing. Um, no problem receiving on ham radio equipment. I don't have a problem putting that information out for people. We're all adults and we all choose to do things in our life that we find, uh, based on decisions and consequences is, is okay. With that said, I would love it if you would get licensed again, technician class book cheap inexpensive and it's like fifteen dollars to take a test in your local area you just have to find a ham club there's no reason not to not to test your technician class license so all right that'll do it seven threes seven threes to everybody out there thanks for watching please hit subscribe and i'll talk to you later now let's see if i can actually end this oh i can good night